Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the 10th and final lecture uh, in this series. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do today is to tie together the research agenda uh, on indeterminacy, which has been much of the topic of the, the last nine lectures, uh, and describe how I see it generating a path for future research. So uh, in the first part of the talk, uh, I'm going to show you some data and tell you what it is about that data that leads me to be skeptical um, of both classical and new Keynesian views of uh, models of the economy. Uh, and that will really lead in to an alternative, which uh, I call model state indeterminacy. So in part two, then, I'm going to tell you about the research I'm engaged in, the path that I want to use both from the pieces that you've seen so far um, and um, work that I briefly mentioned uh, in your first year class and that I'll tell you a little more about today. There are a number of readings. I've now on the class website that you can access. By the class website, I mean the Dropbox folder that you all have access to uh, on, on my own website. I've, I've now updated pretty much all of the readings with links, uh, not just the required readings, but there are also quite a few links there for non-required readings that I think will be helpful for you uh, in understanding uh, where this is all going. There are three readings that uh, I'd like you to look at uh, this week, in particular today, for today's class. The first part is um, really what this whole lecture is about today. It, it's a, an entry that I wrote for the Oxford Encyclopedia of Economics and Finance. It's called the Indeterminacy Agenda in Macroeconomics, uh, and it describes both the work on dynamic indeterminacy, uh, where it originated historically, uh, and the, the uh, innovations in it that you've been seeing in the last few lectures. Um, and it also ties them in with what I'll talk about today, which I'll refer to as models of steady state indeterminacy. There's a piece here, the second piece I would say is not really required reading. It's more of a interest piece if you want to have a look at it. And it's a piece I wrote in order to try to generate some um, convergence between two schools of thought, post-Keynesian economics and um, new Keynesian economics. Uh, and uh, I, I gave it the rather provocative, provocative title of post-Keynesian stochastic general equilibrium theory. Provocative because most post-Keynesians would run a mile at the idea of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium theory and most dynamic stochastic general equilibrium theorists would never want to be associated with post-Keynesian economics. Um, but um, I, I think it's sort of bedtime reading for you. The third piece is important. I'd like you to have a look at. It's a piece that will be forthcoming this either this year or next in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy. Um, and uh, it's what much of the second part of this lecture, in fact, even much of the first part uh, is, is based around. So let me first talk about what I mean by the indeterminacy agenda. So uh, the indeterminacy agenda, uh, I'm referring to a, a group of people and research that began in the 1980s at the University of Pennsylvania um, and at uh, various schools in Paris. And it, it was, um, that there were two components to it. There was the idea that, uh, that got labeled sunspots, which is the idea that non-fundamental shocks can matter in well-specified models of equilibrium. But importantly also, it was the recognition that overlapping generations models and later uh, models with small degrees of uh, increasing returns led to a possibility for um, multiple dynamic equilibria. So those are the sorts of things I've been talking about in the first nine lectures. Phase two is, is uh, 
work that was much of which was carried on it were by research teams that I directed at, at the University of California. Uh, and those are models of steady state indeterminacy. So I'd like to talk today about how these two pieces are related. And I'd like to talk about uh, how the both sets of ideas can be united and what they add to the construction of models that I hope can give a better representation of the data than either classical or, or New Keynesian economics. There are two central components in the research program that I'm engaged in, and those are what I take to be two important ideas from Keynes's general theory. And there's a link here, which I've also added on the class website, to uh, the general theory. Um, it's, it's now open source because the general theory is, is no longer in, in uh, private domain. It's been published long enough. Uh, and parts of it are certainly worth reading. In fact, all of it is worth reading. The two ideas I want to concentrate on are that market economies can get stuck uh, in a, an equilibrium. That's, that's a word that we would use today. I'm not sure. Well, Keynes would have used it too, uh, in which there's high unemployment. And Keynes used the notion of involuntary unemployment. The way that I think we would describe that using the language of modern general equilibrium theory is that there is a continuum uh, of steady state uh, equilibrium unemployment rates. And by equilibrium, I mean that uh, there's no incentive for private agents to, um, to change the situation in, in any way. And that's something that uh, neoclassical models, including New Keynesian models, have a great deal of trouble with. It's not a property of either the classical model or the New Keynesian model. It was a, an important component of the general theory. And it's also one of the reasons that post Keynesians uh, are not very happy with the interpretations of the general theory. The second component, which is related to this notion of sunspot equilibria, is that one, when you have multiple steady state equilibria, the equilibrium that prevails uh, is selected by what Keynes called the animal spirits of participants in the asset markets. And I will try to explain that idea in terms of a dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model today. Basically, it's the idea that market psychology, instead of being determined by preferences, endowments and technologies, becomes an independent fundamental uh, causal factor in, in macroeconomics. Uh, to understand how we use the terms aggregate demand and supply today and how those usages differ from what Keynes meant by aggregate demand and aggregate supply, I recommend this piece here, which is linked. Again, this is not required, but it will help you to understand where I'm coming from. Uh, it's a piece I wrote called Aggregate Demand and Supply, which is published in the International Journal of Economic Theory. And here's a link to that paper. So in the first nine lectures, I explained why overlapping generations models display indeterminate steady state equilibria. I argued that beliefs matter and should be added to models as independent fundamentals. Today, um, I'm sorry, let me go back. The final point on this slide, the point of those first nine lectures was to show you why realistic demographic structures typically lead to dynamic indeterminacy. Now, uh, the, the most we managed to arrive at in, in the examples we looked at were models with four steady state equilibria. What I'm going to do now is to explain to you why I think there's another kind of market failure going on in macroeconomies. Uh, instead of ending up with four steady state equilibria, the analysis I'm going to describe leads to models with a continuum of steady state equilibria. I believe that much of what's gone wrong in the last 30, 40 years in macro 
is the introduction, the reintroduction of the idea that the labour market is characterised by a situation where the quantity of labour supplied is always equal to the quantity of labour demanded. That certainly was not what Keynes thought in the general theory, it's what caused him to introduce the concept of involuntary unemployment. In my own view is banishing that concept as we've done was a big mistake. I'm going to explain why models that assume that the quantity of labour demanded equals the quantity of labour supplied have a lot of trouble understanding data. And I'm going to explain why the new Keynesian model does not help in resolving that problem. I will briefly sketch for you a, a, a class of models that I talked about last year, which I call Keynesian search theory. I'll explain how those models can uh, understand data. And the, uh, the consequence of adopting that as a theory is that it gives us a model of understanding steady state indeterminacy and thereby understanding some of the features that I'll talk about. So um, first of all, some history of thought. Keynes wrote the general theory in 1936. Uh, shortly after he wrote it, Hicks tried to reconcile Keynesian ideas with general equilibrium theory. And there is a, a famous piece here, which I've linked. Again, this is background reading, but I, if you had never seen it, you should have a look at it. He wrote a piece called Mr. Keynes and the Classics, in which he translated the language of, general, of the general theory into general equilibrium theory, and he, or in particular temporary equilibrium theory, uh, and he gave us the ISLM model. Now Hicks had actually been working uh, about the same time on the book Value and Capital, which came out um, in the same decade. And it was the ideas from Value and Capital that he used to, uh, to think about what Keynes had been saying. Um, in particularly, the ISLM model takes the price level as, as given. So that led to an issue which in the history of thought, which was what determines prices. In 1958, uh, um, a New Zealander who was working at LSE at the time, Auburn Phillips, wrote an influential paper, the relation between unemployment and the rate of change of money in the United Kingdom, um, and that led to what's now known as the Phillips curve. Again, background reading, there's a link to that paper, and if you've never read that paper, it's an absolute gem. I, I really recommend you have a look at it. It's a fantastic piece of empirical work. That paper was seized on by uh, what I'm going to call the North American Keynesians. So these were people working uh, on the East Coast of the United States in particular Samuelson, um, as a link between what they thought of as the short run and the long run. And for the, the story of how that became incorporated into macroeconomics, you need only look at any contemporary undergraduate macroeconomics book. Um, obviously, the classic I think that most people use these days is uh, uh, Mankiw's book. Importantly, the Phillips curve disappeared in the data as soon as the ink was dry on the paper. Uh, and for a discussion, a further discussion of the history of thought, and again, background reading, there's a piece, piece here I wrote for the Bank of England Quarterly Bulletin uh, when I was a Hubler Norman fellow at the bank, uh, and that's linked here. So again, we're still on history of thought. Now, let's go back to Keynes's attack on what he called classical economics. And in particular, I'd like to talk about the data that uh, he found inconsistent with classical economics. He characterized classical economics with the following two postulates. So these are direct quotes from the general theory. What he called the first postulate <clears throat> is that the wage is equal to the marginal product of labor. And I'll read you the quote exactly. He goes on to say, that is to say, the wage of an employed person is equal to the value which would be lost if employment were to be reduced by one unit 
after deducting any other costs which this reduction of output would avoid, subject, however, to the qualification that the equality may be disturbed in accordance with certain principles if competition and markets are imperfect. I'll go on to say some more about that in a minute. Keynes's second postulate was, quote, again, this is a direct quote from the journal theory, and it appears very early in, in, in chapter two. The utility of the wage when a given volume of labor is employed is equal to the marginal disutility of that amount of employment. And here's a, a, a precy of what follows. He says, the real wage of an employed person is that which is just sufficient to induce the volume of labor actually employed to be forthcoming. Disutility must here be understood to cover every kind of reason which might lead a man or a body of men to withhold their labor rather than accept a wage which had to them a utility below a certain minimum. Okay, so I'm gonna look at what those uh, two principles mean. In particular though, Keynes accepted the first postulate but rejected the second. I'm going to show you some data that was available to Keynes that might help explain why he rejected the second postulate. And I'm going to explain why those data are inconsistent, both with the real business cycle model, um, with flexible prices, and spoiler alert for what I will say later, they are also inconsistent with the sticky price New Keynesian explanation of Keynes economics. So in, in many writings in the last few it, decade or more, I've said things like the new Keynesian model is neither new nor Keynesian. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to try and uh, flesh that idea out. So after Keynes introduced the ISLM model, economists split into two warring factions. What I will call the North American Keynesians, and that were so people in that category would have been Samuelson, Tobin at Yale, Medigliani at MIT, interpreted the general theory to mean that involuntary unemployment is a temporary phenomenon caused by slowly adjusting wages and prices. So in other words, what we're observing is a disequilibrium um, in the short run. At Cambridge, England, there was a group that included notably Joan Robinson, Richard Kahn, Jeff Harcourt, Wynne Godley, who rejected that approach. They led to a school that became known as post Keynesians. And in particular, Joan Robinson has a quote which I very much like. She called the ISLM approach bastard Keynesianism. There was a second difference in that the North American Keynesians embraced micro founded mathematical models. And their work evolved into what we now think of as New Keynesian economics. They tied the short run to the long run with the Phillips curve. Now, one of the, so the, just to understand the intellectual history, um, Bob Solo, who was a, a Keynesian contemporary of, of Samuelson, who is still alive, was one of the thesis advisors of Mike Woodford, who became, um, really wrote the, the modern, uh, New Keynesian Bible. Uh, so th there's an intellectual continuity between those sets of ideas. Uh, on the other side, uh, the Cambridge UK School rejected micro-based mathematical models and their work evolved into post-Keynesian economics. The New Keynesian economists rest their interpretation of Keynes on sticky prices. So their idea is that Markets don't clear in the short run, the economy is Keynesian. Uh, in the classical, in the long run, it, the economy becomes classical uh, and is well described by uh, flexible price general equilibrium theory. And the connection between the short run and the long run was the Phillips curve. I have a, a very different interpretation, a micro founded interpretation of involuntary unemployment in which all prices are perfectly flexible and I will describe that alternative for you today. 
My work rejects the sticky price interpretation and I replace it with the idea that there are missing factor markets. That's what I call Keynesian search theory. And um, I do not have time in these lectures to go over that theory in great depth. It's best explained in my paper Confidence Crashes and Animal Spirits in the Economic Journal, which is linked here. And some more of the consequences, and in fact, a summary of these ideas uh, is described in the Oxford Economic Journal, pay, uh, the Oxford Economic Journal, uh, not the Economic Journal, the, uh, it's well described in uh, this paper here. So um, if you read this paper carefully, and I would like you to do that along with this lecture, uh, I go into quite a lot more depth than I will have time to do today uh, to talk about exactly the, 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 the micro foundations. And as I say on the last part of the slide, now would be a good time to review your first year notes on this topic. OK, so why would you <clears throat> reject the idea of sticky prices? And there's a sense in which the slide I'm showing you here is a throwaway because whether or not Keynes rejected it or not is not the point. The point is it's inconsistent with data. Uh, but Many people cite the fact that Keynes, it's the initial point in the general theory, assumes sticky wages. But there's an important point that I'd like to make. So this again is a direct quote from the general theory. He says, so in this summary, which is the summary of his ideas in the first two chapters, we shall assume that the money wage and other factor costs are constant per unit of labor employed. In other words, I'm assuming sticky money wages. <clears throat> but this simplification with which we shall dispense later is introduced solely to facilitate the exposition. And that's my emphasis. So in particular, Keynes did not think his work was based on sticky prices. Whether or not you think that's a compelling reason to reject New Keynesian economics uh, is, is irrelevant. I'm going to talk about the data. And I'm going to give you two data driven reasons to reject a version of Keynesian economics based on sticky prices. So the first one is that there is no evidence for wage or price stickiness in the largest depression in recorded history, which is the Great Depression. Secondly, I'm going to show you why Keynes, in my view, rejected the second postulate. Uh, and I'm going to show you why New Keynesian and classical models cannot easily explain the co-movements we see in data between employment and consumption. Let me turn first to the question about price, nominal price and wage rigidity. Both of these pictures are showing you data from the United States from 1929 through 1939, the Great Depression. In both cases, the red line is the unemployment rate, and it's measured on the right axis on an inverted scale. So notice that in 1929, the unemployment rate in the US was about 3%. It peaked in 1933 at around 24%, uh, and it never fell below 15% in the whole of the Great Depression. The blue line is showing you the log of a money wage index. It's that <clears throat> money wages fell substantially. From uh, well, if you look at the absolute magnitude, money wages fell by approximately 75 uh, percent. Let me restate that they were about seven. They fell by 25 percent. They were about 75 percent. Of their in 1933 of their 1929 level, and the same is true of money prices, which are described here. So these are in logarithmic units, and if you do the calculation of the logarithmic change from both prices and wages, you'll find that the the the, the, the 1933 minimum is about 75 percent of the starting value. Okay. So. My first reason then to be skeptical uh, of sticky prices is that prices were clearly not sticky. Uh, 
second reason to reject the New Keynesian interpretation is that it's based on a modified version of a classical labor market in which the quantity of labor demanded is equal to the quantity of labor supplied. And in particular, the second postulate that Keynes rejected in modern general equilibrium theory is the statement that utility maximizing households are on their labor supply curves. So let me turn to a mathematical, simple mathematical description of what Keynes called the first and second postulates. So the, the simplest version of a classical model would be the real business cycle model in which output is produced from capital and labor and in which uh, the marginal product of labor is equated to the real wage. So this is what that equation would look like for a Cobb Douglas production function. So KT minus one is the capital stock brought into the period. LT is employment this period. Alpha is the uh, coefficient on capital in the production function. Um, and uh, S is the marginal, is a productivity shock. So that's simply a statement of the first order condition for uh, intertemporal, intratemporal maximization um, in, a, in a classical model. What about the second postulate? Well, the second postulate says that um, the, it, it, again, translated into a modern maximizing model, would say that the slope of an indifference curve so that would be the ratio of the marginal utility of consumption to the marginal utility of leisure is equal to the real wage. This is what that equation would look like for a Cobb-Douglas production function where gamma is the weight on, on leisure. That's what Keynes called the second postulate and that's what he rejected. Now, in, in, let me show you why that's inconsistent with data. <clears throat> well, in the real business cycle model, leisure, which is the measure of unemployment, the reason it's a measure of unemployment is recall everybody is on their labor supply curve. And in simple models where, um, where there's no other alternative use for time, everyone who is unemployed is simply engaged in consuming leisure. So if, if preferences are logarithmic, the, the model uh, leads in its solution to the following statement. Uh, again, with, with logarithmic preferences, the, uh, the, the, the representative agent will consume uh, a fixed fraction of his lifetime wealth, so that's this term W, on consumption each period, and on leisure each period. So this term here, I'm here I'm I, I'm normalizing the consumption good, the price of the consumption good to one. So this person is going to consume a fixed fraction of his wealth each period on consumption and a fixed fraction of his wealth each period on leisure. So this person has one unit of, le of leisure each period. That's the value of this. Um, and L is his labor supply. So one minus L is, the, is the, the fraction of his time he spends on leisure and W over P is the real wage. So that translates that into consumption units. Um, so notice um, if you add up um, the, the, these two terms, you'll, you'll find that the, the, the expenditure in period T, which is this term plus this term, is just equal to one minus beta times wealth. Okay. What's wealth? Well, just as in the models we, we've been looking at in the last nine lectures, wealth is the discounted present value of his endowment, which is uh, this term, plus any financial wealth he brings into the period, that's this term. So importantly, um, Notice that from the first order conditions, 
consumption expenditure on leisure and expenditure on consumption should move in the same direction. Um, that's not what happens. Again, here I'm showing you the unemployment rate, this time um, on a, a scale of 0 to 30. So the consumption of leisure, that is unemployment, goes up sharply in the first four years of the Great Depression, but consumption goes down sharply. So these two, C and 1 minus L, move sharply in opposite directions. Now, it's possible that these two things move sharply in opposite directions because of movements in the real wage, which are offsetting. But that's not what happened. Rather than decreasing, this figure shows that the real wage increased in the first three years of the Great Depression. These data are actually consistent with movement along a labor demand curve, which is consistent with what Keynes called the first postulate. So those are the facts that led Keynes to be unhappy with um, the explanation uh, given in the Great Depression. And you might say, well, yes, but you've described for me the real business cycle model, which is a flexible price model. Uh, and uh, the New Keynesian model is not that. The New Keynesian model is a sticky price model. But I would point out that in the New Keynesian model, the households are on their labor supply curve. And in the simplest explanations of New Keynesian economics, the reason that, that uh, employment is not at its flexible price level is because firms are slow to adjust prices because they have monopolistic power in the goods market. So in the New Keynesian explanation um, of, or the, the, at least the first iteration of New Keynesian models, it, it was, uh, it, it's, it's, the, it, it's the first postulate that's breaking down, not the second, and that is inconsistent with the data I've just shown you. Okay, so um, we're going to take a 10 minute break, and um, when we get back, uh, I see we have some uh, Keynes and Hayek uh, video there. Do you have a link for that, Dennis? Yes, I can share it in the comments, yes. Yeah, I, I have it somewhere. So the background there that you're looking at in Dennis's slide is a wonderful uh, rap video put together, uh, uh, which I recommend uh, on uh, Keynes and Hayek. So maybe you can share it with the group, uh, Dennis. All right. We're going to break.